Welcome to Paranormal Heart, a place where people can talk about their paranormal experiences. With your host, Cat Ward. Welcome, my friends, to Paranormal Heart Podcast, a safe place to talk about your paranormal encounters. I'm your host, Kat Ward. Folks, in episode 118, my guest is David Oman, who is a producer, creator, co-writer, and owner of the famous Oman House. David's current home is only 150 feet away from the infamous Sharon Tate Murder House. He talks about his inspiration to write his book, Ghosts of Cielo Drive, the Afterlife of Sharon Tate and the Spirits of the Omen House, and his movie, House at the End of the Drive. David also shares his experiences with paranormal activity that occurred during the construction of his home, which he still experiences. The Omen House has been featured on shows such as Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures, and David has been on many shows such as The Howard Stern Show. He discusses some terrifying encounters, including his mother, when he was a child, picking up hitchhikers, who may have been part of the Sharon Tate murder. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you have any stories related to supernatural experiences like ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, extraterrestrials, local legends, or your psychic gifts, I would love to hear from you. You can be a guest on the show and share your story, or you can send me your real story for me to narrate on the show. You can reach me at paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. If you want to remain anonymous, I will make sure not to mention your real name. The new episodes of the show are released on the second and last Sunday of each month at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's located on YouTube, Podbean, KPNL Digital Network, and all major podcast platforms. If you wish to support the show, please share it with others, like each episode, and don't forget to leave a review. It will help us reach more people and make them realize they are not alone in their paranormal experiences. Additionally, you can now find Paranormal Heart Podcast merchandise on Tee Public. You can buy mugs, t-shirts, hats, and more. Please share the Tee Public link with others. Hello, David. Welcome to Paranormal Heart Podcast. Well, thank you very much, Kat. I appreciate you having me on your show today. I really appreciate you being here. It's uh, it, it was a struggle for a bit, but we finally made it. Absolutely. I apologize for the last, you know, on my behalf that I ended up having to cancel out. And I, I did too. So, you know, life happens and sometimes you just can't get situated. You know, it, well, time zones too. Yeah, that's true too. The time zones, exactly. It's a yep. totally different situation. So... The, for those of you who don't know David Omen, and I'm pretty sure my listeners do, um, could you just give us a little bit of background? Sure. My name is David Omen. I, um, I'm known mostly for this home that I live in that my father and I built down the driveway from Sharon Tate's old house on Cielo Drive, private. Um, and now we're going to be talking about, I, I'm no, I should say the reason why the house is well known is because it's um, famously haunted. Um, and what I mean by that is nobody died on this property that we know of. And the house is purported to be, according to Dr. Barry Taff, the Mount Everest of haunted houses and the Disneyland for the dead. Due to the DC EMF levels that are registered here that are literally off the charts. Insane. And we have lots of <laughs> paranormal activity and visitors um, that pop through and come through the house all the time. Um, other than that, I just released my motion picture, my first feature film mo- motion picture, House at the End of the Drive, um, inspired by the spirit of Sharon Tate and the aftermath of the Sharon Tate murders that took place 55 years ago in August of 1969. I have not yet seen it, but it is on my on my list of things to do. I, I really look forward to seeing it. So for those of you who might not know, um, they have coined the Sharon Tate House. I think it, I think they coined it the uh, Tate Murder House. 
Uh, yeah. It was demolished in 1994, and you and your father built your home that you're living in now in 1999, only 150 feet away from uh, Sharon Tate's home. I have to find. I have to ask, why did you pick that location? That's a good question, and I'll be very, very clear and honest with you. It has absolutely, positively nothing to do with my personal interest, which before I bought the lot was non-existent about Sharon Tate and the others that had died here, but literally 100% based upon financial um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, my father called me up late November on a Sunday morning at eight o'clock in, uh, in 1998 and woke me up and said, David, I found a lot. It's for sale. It's in Beverly Hills. It's $40,000. Get your ass up and wow. let's go. Let's go meet at the lot. Meet there. And I'm like, Dad. And this again for your audience. This is pre-internet, so it's not like you can just as today, God forbid, go look online. Blah, 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 blah. It's physically in a newspaper. It's the Sunday classified edition of Los Angeles Times. And again, just to bring your audience up to speed, the classified section of the LA Times on Sunday had listings and ads for dogs, cats, jobs, property, real estate, boats, everything un under the sun. Again, this is like you would go look on Google and say, All right, what are, what's available on Google search for, for, to buy? So I said, Dad, and I'm again waking up at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and at that 1998 was not something you'd want to see me doing. I'm like, uh, Dad, yeah, uh -huh. I, I probably went to bed around 2.30 in the morning coming up, coming back from friends and partying because it was the season. And I said, dad, let me just ask you, does the, does the listing say four zero K the price? And he goes, yeah. I said, dad, it's a typo. It's, there's no, <laughs> freaking, I said, dad, I said, I started to get, I started to wake up because I'm listening to what he's saying and I'm trying to wrap my head around it and going $40,000 for a piece of, of, of an empty lot in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Not a chance in the freaking world, I said. And he goes, well, look, it's a foreclosure. And once he said it was a foreclosure on the lot, I said, huh, uh huh, uh huh, eh? all right, whatever. I'm not going to get him off the phone. And I felt like I was being pushed to get off my ass, get up out of bed by an unseen force, because usually I would have blown him off. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, I would have thought 40, it's like, it's like every reason in the book, why am I doing this? That doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. So I said, okay, dad, I figured, what do I have to lose? Might as well. And like I said, something kind of, I don't want to say pushed me, but kind of like said to me, go. And I just said, okay, fine. What I'm, you know, what, what I have to lose. I figured after, after 10 minutes on the phone, the blood was flowing. I wasn't going to go right back to sleep. And I said, ah, I don't want to piss my father off. So I get in my car, I drive up there and or up here. And I, I, I got out of the car and I looked down the street and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting flashback memories going. I remember this street. Holy hell in a handbasket. That's where Sharon Tate was killed. I'm thinking, oh, God, this is not only ironic. This is just straight out of batshit crazy land. Because I'm thinking after high school, well, back it up, back in 1978, I had read Helter Skelter. And of course I wasn't driving, but I had friends that used to drive and we all read the freaking book and we're all like tripped out to the crazy about this terrible tragedy. And it happened literally in the close enough in the area that we could get to it easily. So I remember the very first time my friends drove us up here, there was about seven or eight of us. We went to the gate and we all have beers in our hand. Of course we're underage drinking. So let's forget about that. But, we're, we're looking at, they're all looking at the gate. They're, they're, they go up to the gate. They start laughing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I just felt like, you know something? I the book to heart because I think that my godfather, my, my, I know for a fact, my godfather was Richard Dawson's manager back in the early 60s. Oh, really? And yeah, he and, and my godfather told me a story about Richard when they, when they offered Richard Hogan's Heroes. Yeah. Richard was like, I want to play Hogan. And my God, my God, my Godfather Leonard said, goes, they're offering you the part of Newkirk, a supporting role. He goes, I, and Richard was like, I want to, it's like, and Leonard says, 
you're a goddamn comic off the gosh darn London, you know, show on the London circuit there. Who the hell do you think you are that you should be cast as the lead with no credits in television or films and stuff at this time in the U.S.? And Richard's like, oh, no, no. And my godfather says, Richard, shut up. Stop bitching and take the goddamn gig. You'll thank me late. And sure enough, had Richard not in that show, his career would have gone probably nowhere as a result. But because he did... Mm -hmm. That led him to Family Feud, which led him to soap, to Leonard the Running Man. So my godfather just said, because sometimes you got to get somebody's ear, get them by the pinch of the bottom of the ear, and get them to do what they want to do, regardless of what they don't want to do, regardless of what they think, because you know this is an opportunity. It's a chance to get yourself out there and get yourself on a mainstream show. And so I remember that my godfather was well-connected with a lot of different people in the industry. And my parents, as a matter of fact, were also, you know, had lots of friends in the industry. So when we were talking about the Sharon Tate murders, it felt like I had been hearing this when I was a kid, a lot about them, not just Sharon, but more about Jay and stuff, because my parents had a little shop for thing on Melrose Avenue, not too far down the street from where Jay had his hair salon on Melrose Avenue. And it was called House of Renaissance. It was high-end plumbing fixtures that they had in this small little little um, storefront on Melrose. And I used to walk up and down the street on Melrose by myself at like the age of like six years old because I was so freaking bored of being at the gosh darn at the at the uh, what was it at the uh, the out the, the store. So I have a feeling that there was some reason why I personally felt you know kind of like bad for them. And it was, you know, because it was always bandied around about them and how young she was. So when I got there and I'm sitting there looking at through the gate, I just got sorrowful and mournful and said, you know, saying, before I take a sip of anything, I want to bow my head and honor those who died here. For that was just the, this overwhelming sense of, you know, this is hallowed ground and you assholes are being pricks about it, laughing about it because you remember reading the book and oogling and ogling. Meantime, from the point where the gate was, you couldn't see a god darn thing in there. All you saw was straight ahead was the driveway, and that's it. Because the house and the park and the um, garage structure and everything was around to the right of the entrance. Mm -hmm. so all you saw was the, the gate, and then it just chain link fence and just entrance, and it just was empty. But I just kept on saying, you know, saying I feel so bad for these people. And I remember every time I went there after that with my friends and even by myself. Well, it had to be with my friends. They'd be like, thank you. <laughs> they go, close with somebody because somebody always knew how to get there. So after high school, when I used to come up here, try to find the place, this is what's spooky. There's one, two, three private driveways on the entirety of the street before it cuts into branches off into two streets. I could never find the gosh darn street on my own. So this is what's so gosh god darn strange about the whole thing. I'm sitting here 20 years later after my first visit here, and I don't know how because he gave me the location of the, and I found it on my Thomas guide. And I'm looking there, I'm looking at the game going, this is totally nuts. I said, this is just like deja vu all over again. And but I noticed that the driveway goes to the very end and then it stops. And then I just see it like comes, like it drops down and all I see is dirt and gravel all the way past in. So I started to realize that the house that was there gone five, five what was it? Four years earlier, they had started the demolition. And it's like, I walked, I looked around and said, I can't believe I can't. And then my dad drives up in his 1998 or 97 Firebird. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> my dad's even so old. I'm, I'm one of those, those Tony Randall kids. It's like, how old was your dad? <laughs> Angel's like, don't ask. He was up there. He was, I mean, my dad this year would be, let's see, this is 2024. Jesus Christ. 108 years old. Today. So. My dad was old school. So I said, Dad, Dad, I said, that's, you know what that is? I'm pointing down the end of the day. That's where the Sharon Tate murders took place. And he looks at me, he goes, 
what the hell do I give a rat's ass? Something to the effect, what do I give a, a rat's ass about that? We're here to look at this lot. Focus, kid, focus. <laughs> and I'm, I say, oh, I said, no, I said, I said, God, I started looking, I finally started paying attention because I'm totally captivated by the fact that I'm here and I'm having flashbacks and reminiscing. And he's and the stout's just flowing through me and he goes, Focus. And I didn't even chan- take a chance to look at the lot that's right there on my left. And I look down and I go, son, I said, it's pretty steep, Pops. I said, do you really think it's, he goes, it's $40,000. And he goes, and if you look closely, as I started to realize, he says, somebody started building a house here and stopped. I said, what do you, he goes, well, do you see between the weeds, I can see some pieces of rebar, which to the, to which to those that don't know, is basically, in this case, it's about a half an inch, yeah, about a half an inch thick pieces of steel that you put inside of concrete caissons or concrete structures to reinforce the concrete so that it's not flexible. Because if you have, Pops, help me out with this, not unsecured. What's it called, Dad? It is called unsecured? Oh, unre- thank you. He says, if it's unreinforced concrete, it crumbles. There's nothing inside of concrete that keeps it rigid. And that's what people understand. So when you build walls and structures and things with concrete to add rigidity and strength to it, they put in solid steel pieces, not bar or rods, half inch diameter steel rods. And they attach and they make cages that they then put inside before they pour the concrete so that it's completely structurally sound. So it will not break through earthquakes or impacts or whatever. So it's, un- so it's, and I said, I see this, the rebar, he goes, well, there's no way in the hell that there's rebar sticking up from gosh on the soil. I said, what do you mean? He goes, there's not only, I went down a few feet and I said, I took some of the weeds and I said, dad, there's actually rebar on top of the soil lengthwise across. He goes, that's what I'm telling you. Somebody started building a house. I said, what do you mean? He goes, if I'm not crazy, and because I don't think I am in building houses for all my, you know, the past some odd, what was it, it was 82 then. So for the past 70 some odd years, he goes, no, not 70, dumbass, 50 some odd years. Thank you. He said, there's going to be pilings or caissons in the earth that, you know, that's the why that's, that's attached to the reef. I said, oh, shit. He goes, and if that's the case, and this place is $40,000 on a foreclosure, this is a big, 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 big opportunity. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, he, he, he calculated, he goes, to go down, he goes, probably a dozen caissons. It turns out there were 13, two foot deep, two foot wide, 30 foot deep holes in the ground filled with these, with the reinforced rebar cage going down and filled with concrete. Attached to the, on top of that on the surface is the rebar to build the, the concrete foundation for the house. He goes, that alone is worth $100,000 worth of improvements wow. because you have to bring out a drill rig and drill the holes deep into the hole, into the ground, and then bring in the, the rebar and bring in the concrete and do that whole thing. That saves you $100,000. He goes, the lot itself, he goes, if it's buildable, should be worth around $300,000 in today's market. Mm-hmm. That's that. He goes, if we can get this for $40,000, and this is, I quote him, he goes, we can build this house and we can flip it. And I'm like, no, 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 dad, 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 dad. I'm thinking to myself, dad, I've watched you build 10, 15 houses in my lifetime and been on most of those construction sites, including the house that my sister lived in or lives in and other houses, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, it's always been my dream because the house that he that I grew up in, he built, literally. And I was born and I was brought right into that house. It was a brand new house. And I said to him, I said, Pops, all right. I said, all right. I, I, I was thinking my, 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 my guys were saying, don't rock the boat, you stupid son of a bitch. You don't have the goddamn lot to argue with. So shut up and get the lot and then work him over to get him to say, no, maybe we will. you'll keep the house and you'll live here. So he ends up doing all of this. He says, yeah, somebody tried to build a house here some 15 years ago, and the city stopped them. And he went and he looked up in the, the code books, and he found that the original lot property 
up here on the street was called a private drive. Somewhere between 1975 and 1985, somebody changed the gosh darn thing to private street. And he says, it shouldn't, it can't, you can't switch them. They're not interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Legally speaking, there's a difference why one says drive and one says street. Street is maintained by the city, so it has to be a certain a width, has to be certain width, so that was it um, emergency vehicles would have an access point to have a 38 foot turnaround spot so they could access and get out easily of that private street. <coughs> also, the utilities and sewer lines are brought up and maintained by the city up to the up to the lots up there. And the pavement, et cetera, et cetera, is regulated by the city and the speed limit is regulated by the city. A private drive is the exact opposite. It has no re minimum requirements that it has to be the street width. The utilities are serviced at the bottom of the street, the proper street, and your sewer line, you have to bring that all up to the lots yourself. You have to pave the, the driveway yourself. There are no speed limits. So literally, people want to go 100 miles an hour on the street, on the private drive, you can and not get ticketed wow. because it's property mm -hmm. we can put a gate at the bottom and, and prohibit people from make accessing the property up here which i've been you know struggling to do for years and can't get a consensus with all the neighbors so he ends up having it taking it back to the building and safety department's clues shows them the clear clear that you know uh, in addition to change a to b it has to revert back to a which means that the obstruction for construction is gone and we could build on the lot. So we got that cleared up. We bought the lot and we ended up building here. And the house was just magnificent. I mean, he designed it himself. Um, myself, my dad, my mom was very instrumental into putting in the, choosing the, the marble and the stuff and the tile and around the house because she goes, you know, it's got to be functional and good for the future, not just for tomorrow, and but for forever. So we, you know, it was all a family project, so to speak. Um, and once I moved in, I was as happy as a clam. However, during construction, we found out that the house had some unique properties. Something like um, wasn't uh, it wasn't a uh, a house that was alone that you ever were alone in or are in. And I found this out not just by my own personal experiences because I felt enough times walking around the house where people, somebody's kind of tippy toe up, up behind me and then say, boo. And I turn around and say, there's no one there. No, 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 no. And it was that weird feeling of just like, like somebody being behind you, not threatening, but just you could feel their presence. And it was very haunting. <laughs> Pardon the joke. <laughs> um, and when we were six months done. So obviously, I didn't want to cause any ruffles and strife for the contract laborers, but they were having their own problems of, of, that I couldn't explain. But I wasn't going to get into the minutia of, you know, I got to uh, let's 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 go to because once you do that, if they flip out, and the nine times out of ten, because they're Latin, they're Latin American, they were from El Salvador, they're heavy heavily invested in the Catholic church. So if you tell them there's a ghost, the first thing they're going to think is a demon and they're going to flip out and go. And here's my point. Um, they were having stuff, objects like tools going from one part of the house where they left it the day before and they couldn't find it. And they say, why did you, I said, why did I move the, why would I move the air hammer? I know better. I said, I told you guys to put everything. Cause I said, we don't have a big fence in front of the place that somebody couldn't get over the fence and get onto the property and start messing stuff, stuff around even though it was up here, you know, you still have people that go looking around and scouring for stuff at con construction sites to see what they can steal. Yep. So they said, goes, well, we couldn't find the, the air hammer. I said, well, I don't. turns out it was in a different part of the house and they went in the day before. I didn't touch it. I wouldn't be so stupid to do that. So I told him, I said, just, just keep everything in the goddamn lockbox and cut the crap. You won't have problems if you're not putting stuff in a lockbox that's secured somewhere in the house and no one's having access to so six months before we're done the actual construction, we have to get, we have to move to the next phase, which is rough construction is done. We're now going to the finishing process, meaning the five laborers that are here during the rough construction are going to be released. So I said to the guys, I said, look, you guys are going to be clearing out in a few days in a day or two. I said, I got to ask you, have you guys had any strange experiences here in the house? Cause I'm thinking, 
they work here. They might not be telling me stuff. And, you know, if I'm not asking, they're not talking. And I said, this is a great opportunity for a test pool of guys between the ages of 15 and 35, the 15-year-old being the 35-year-old son, that are totally devoid of knowledge of the Sharon Tate murders. They're from El Salvador. They speak, you know, a little English, but they, you know, they don't know the, the, the story of the, you know, the history of that murders, and I'm not telling them. And I said, this is a great chance. Let's see what the hell. So I lined them up in the dining room, which is now the dining room, and I sat, had them in a semicircle. I said, guys, I said, no, I said, tell me, is there anything happened? Yeah, blah, blah. One guy says, yeah. I said, yeah, like what? He goes, yeah, it, he goes, it, he goes, he told me, he goes, it messed with me bad. I said, he goes, six months ago when I was um, working here in mid July, I'm uh, on the third floor working, and I hear it's, it's also it's, it's, it's ninety some odd degrees. It was hot as hell. We the house is up, but there was no air conditioning. So he says, "I'm down there, and I hear voices coming from the top floor." I said, "I hear voices talking and a blah blah." blah. I figured it's you and your father. So I started. So I said, "Senor David, Senor Paul, dónde está?" So he goes up the stairs. He goes, "There's no one there." I said, what do you mean? He goes, I look on the entire top floor. And he goes, it's open. I said, yeah, the whole top floor is, is just you, it's just all open. It's like one big floor coming down from the di- entrance, t- from the dining room t- into the living room. It's all wide open. There's no walls, basically. It's mm-hmm. just a step wall, whatever. And he says, I look around. I can't find anybody. I go outside. I look up and down the street. And he goes, there's not a single car in the street. And I said, God, I've been here at 7 in the evening in the summertime, and there's no one here. The place is a desolate ghost town. He goes, yeah, exactly. So he says he doesn't understand what the hell is going on. He goes back downstairs and he starts working. He says five minutes later, he goes to the stairwell. And at the time, unlike today or present day, the stairwell was open. So the stairwell is an eight foot by eight foot by 40 foot cap, cap, basically stairwell. It's wide open. And when it gets to the third floor, it's just opens right into it. You go to the landing and it's right into the, right into the theater room. So he says, I go running upstairs again. And this time I go on the second floor after I go on the first floor and I see nothing there. It's empty. He goes, it doesn't sound like the voice is carrying from down below. Like it's the neighbor who talk, who sits on his, on his balcony, on his roof balcony and sits to him. Sons, he goes, I hear these voices. It's like they're coming from the top floor. He goes, I would have heard those voices coming from there. I would have known it was coming from the guy there. He goes, but they're carrying down the stairwell. I'm going, shit. He says, what do you do this? So he says, I go back downstairs and I'm packing my bags in the other room because it's it you know goes into the, the theater, what is now the theater room, and then there's a doorway into the guest into the guest bedroom now. And he says, I hear these footsteps. He goes, leather soled shoes. And at the time we have no carpet, but going down the wrought iron staircase. The semi-spiral staircase are these two by two inch by ten inch wooden treads, just pieces of two by twelve wood. And he says, "I hear the footsteps coming down the staircase as they, as they, as each foot hit, as each leather sole shoe hits. It's getting louder and louder. It's coming down. So I go into the other room, and I'm sitting there in, inside the door jar, just waiting. He gets. He says it gets so loud, it gets to the bottom of the landing, and it stops." He goes, I run out of the from the room to the door jar and I'm looking at the landing because there's nothing there. Now, mind you, the whole thing is wide open. So you got this 12 foot high entrance into this room and he goes, there's nothing there. He goes, and then it happens. I said, what do you mean? As I, he says, as I'm standing there at the landing, he says, I feel this ice, like a chunk of ice. He describes like a two inch wide band of ice that slowly goes grazing across the back of his neck below his hairline, above his shoulder blades. He says, all of a sudden, he says, he's, his body gets totally straightened and erect. And he says, he says, the hairs of my, um, uh, all over my body, said, just shot straight up. He goes, ados mios, ados mios, yame boy, yame boy, and took off. Now, for those who don't know Spanish, that means, oh my God, oh my God, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. He takes off for six weeks and I'm like, Oh, Oh, Jesus Christ. I remember when that happened. And I said to him, I said, that's when you told the other guys that you were taking care of your sick mother in San Salvador, right? He goes, yeah. 
I said, where are we? Because I was working other jobs. I didn't want to come back. I said, so why did you come back? He goes, I had to come back because I didn't get paid for the prior three weeks. <laughs> now, here's the kicker. He was the guy that was putting in the tiles around the house. So when it came to doing the tile for the master bathroom, that was the last room to do. He blows out of town. And I'm sitting there waiting for week in and week out after the first, you know, when's he going to get back? I want to get the tiles wrapped up on this. I see that. The way it's playing. So I said to them, I said, I ended up getting so fed up of waiting for you after the third week. I said, swear, I'll do it myself. I said, I've watched him put the tiles in the other parts of the house, all the kitchen, the other bathrooms. How tough can it be? Let's just say naivety and stupidity go hand in hand. Just because somebody does something with alacrity and ease and has been doing it for some 10 years doesn't mean that Joe Schmo off the street could just pick up the gosh darn trade, the tricks of the trade in a flash just by watching him through osmosis. I think your cocky egocentric ass is put to shame because it's a lot more complicated than it looks. Just slapping on some 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 paste and then slapping your, your grout and slapping your tiles down. Oh, no, no, no. So I said to him, I said, I said, yeah, I did the tiles. He goes, yeah, I saw the way you did the job. It sucks. <laughs> and I said, you're telling me, he goes, first of all, those are natural stone that you used in your bathroom. Natural stone tile has natural, he says, veins of minerals that cut through them. <laughs> and what you're supposed to do, which I didn't know with natural stone, because I'd seen what the other stones looked all uniform. He goes, yeah, that's because those are not natural. Those are Man, he's in most cases. He goes, it's all uniform. He goes, in this case, you're supposed to take the tiles out of the box and like a jigsaw puzzle, find the patterns and connect the pieces so that you can have that one line of a vein of mineral coming through so it has the pattern so it goes all the way across nice and oh, even. Oh, didn't do that. <laughs> I've got lines going, a mineral line going from left to right in one, and the other one's going straight up and down vertical, and the other one's going right to left, up from the upper corner down. It's like, and he says, and you forgot to use the spaces. I said, no, I use the spaces between the tiles. He goes, not to great effect. I said, I know. I said, I kind of missed. He goes, you got to do one at a time in a way that each one is set, and then you go to the next one. You don't just like a machine gun, lay the tiles down. He goes, and he goes, not to mention, he goes, some of the tiles are a little taller than the others. I said, yeah, I know, I, I know. I was thinking of that, yeah. He goes, you're really, I said, I know. He goes, you know, he says, you're an idiot. I said, I know. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, my father said, he goes, well, I don't give a shit. You have to live with it, not me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, Dad. And I said, at least I know one thing's for sure. If people don't believe the story, all I have to do is walk them into my bathroom and say, here's the gosh darn proof in the pudding. Are you going to tell me that in a million dollar house, I'm going to sit there and kibash the crown jewel of bathrooms, being the master bathroom, to make this look shittier where every other bathroom in the freaking house, all the other three other bathrooms and kitchen and, and the bar all look sweet and perfect, right? But I'm going to do that just to make a point so I can lie about it some 20 years, 22 years later or 23 years later. I was like, no, this is for real. This is... I said, Dad, it's like an albatross around my neck. I'll never forget this. It's, it's there. <laughs> Nobody that doesn't believe it's like, come take a look if you think my story is not true. And that puts it rest to, right to the bone when you think about it. So, um, so yeah. That, activity I, I, right from the get-go, right from building the house. No, even further than that. When, when we bought the lot in January 1999, my um, first, one of my two first cats that I ever owned um, Arthur passed away and um, luckily we had the house already in our possession I mean, the, the lot in my possession at the time so I said I am not going to I, I don't like the idea of, of carrying around a, a little box of ashes myself for, for a relative even though my father did get himself cremated I wasn't choked up on it um, but I said I'm going to bury him on the side of the house on the hill so my friend Sean and I came up here and we lowered ourselves down like things like 10 or 15 feet down the slope of the hill from the driveway. And we um, proceeded to inter Arthur into the earth. And I just remember standing, sitting there on the side of the hill and believe me, it was sitting because it's a pretty steep slope. And Sean, I, I just said like, you know, I had this weird feeling like there were mourners with us as we were bearing Arthur. 
and I said, I said, I just kept thinking to myself, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask Sean. I said, Sean, I said, I said, I had this weird feeling. I said, as we're burying Arthur and literally putting him into the earth, and he's wrapped in a burial shroud of some some jean, old pairs of jeans that I had that I sewn together and I made it as a shroud and I interred him in the earth. I said, I feel like I've got a whole group of congregation, a group of people around us. Mm. I said, spirits. I said, they're not live, but I said, I just feel the sense of comfort and respect. And they're trying to say, it's okay, we're here with you. And he said, David, I didn't want to say anything because of the solemnness of the moment, but I felt the same thing. And it was then that I said, okay. And I realized that when I buried Arthur there, because it was such of such deep um, importance to me and to, to my life, that I was, you know, not marking the territory, but that I was interring my, my dear lost pet with such reverence that there was, it, 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 it basically, basically brought out the, um, the respect of the spirits because I said, I'm here for the long haul. I'm not building this for somebody else. Mm -hmm. This is my house that I will live in till the day I die. I will never let go of this home. And that's why I, it felt like they understood that I was, I would not abandon them as my, uh, later on I would find out that I, that they, it was almost like a kindred spirit, like going, you're one of us. You're, 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 you're solid. You really have integrity. Mm -hmm. You mean what you say and you say what you mean. And I mean, I'm getting all choked up just thinking about it because it was just, you know, it was my, like I said, it was just one of those things that I realized now was very important and poignant in my life when I, when that happened. Cause it was like the first time I really knew, I really knew that we had owned the house, owned the lot and I was letting them know I'm here and I'm not going to leave you. And I will be here with you for eternity. And it was kind of like, wow, what a, what a powerful moment. And you know, like I said, when when things start happening with construction, it never bought. I just knew. I just knew that I was where I was supposed to be. That they were here for my benefit. That here for benefit. And I never feared anything with them. Anything, any of the occurrences. I'd never, ever, ever in the entire time here, honestly, had any sense of fear for my life. <laughs> thank you, thank you. From them, they said. From them, <laughs> other things like humans. Because oh God, yes, you know that's that's a that's the threat was always from the living, never from the dead. And that's why I try to tell people like, who are you scared? It's like of what? What when you have respect for anything, that resonates on such a higher level that animal, fish, bird, you know, spirit or human, it resonates to a place where that's understood and that's something you can't fake you can't project you either have it or you don't and it's that simple and it's like today <laughs> you're gonna love this right as i was coming downstairs i yesterday put this uh little pin piece of tinfoil and some pieces of chicken bones that i had from what i picked off from my cats from the chicken breast meat and i left the bones on this tinfoil specifically because I wanted to attract some of the ravens that were around in the area. And I said, you know, I love these birds. I love them to death. I, I have such respect for them and I consider them a kindred spirit because literally two weeks ago, there was about 50 of them up on the hill in front of my house. And I was like, one, wow. Oh. In the That's trees, on the railing of the construction site above on the, on the plastic on the hill above my house where they have it covered. And I was like, all right, you sons of bitches, we're going to be friends and I'm going to go out of my way to make friends with you. So a couple days later, I put out some more of those chicken bones and they started taking the bones and stuff and eating them. So when I came down, I looked and there's this big, beautiful black raven sitting on the railing, on the wood railing, on the thing, looking at me. I said, I said, oh, my dear. I said, hello, sweetheart. And he like, like got a little fun. I said, shh, 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 shh. What do you think? I have the asshole to put the fucking the carrot pieces out there and the chicken out there. I said, do you think I'm trying to poison you? I said, come on. I said, I'm kosher. I'm cool. Come on. And he just sat and looked at me. That's, that's the little reason why I was late. I was just, I said, I can't break away. And I didn't have my camera to take pictures of him. But I said, I just was like thinking, sweetheart, I got you covered. I like you guys. I think you guys are the bomb. And when I have extra food, I'll put it out there for you guys to come visit. Cause you guys are cool and I dig you guys. And 
to be honest with you, that's about affording them the respect that no one else will give them and treating them like somebody that, you know, you want to have a, a, a communicative friendship with. And it was wonderful because I said, like, I got to go. I said, and it was like, he like, like looked at me like, what? And they flew off. I was like, that's cool. That to me is, that's the coolest thing. He's had. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, to me, you got deer and bobcats and stuff and rattlesnakes. And to me, it's just, I love it up here because of that alone. Because mm. if it wasn't for the animals, it wouldn't be half as fun. Yes, it'd be great with the ghosts. But the wildlife is really what makes it, it makes it much more interesting and, and quality of life goes up tenfold with that in my mind. So, Have you always been able to sense spirits? Is it something you grew up with? Something I've always been intrigued by. Um, I, it, it's one thing to think you have the ability to do that. It's another thing to actually have it. So I'd say as a kid, I always wanted it. Just the same thing. Like I always wanted to, well, all right, shit. All right. You got, you got, you got me. You got me. Stop it. All right. Every time I, I'm about to say something, they said, they said, stop, put that back and remember this. I was like, oh yes. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Shut up. I heard you the first three times, please. They said when I was six, six, I was five, I was six, you know, when I was five years old, a neighbor kid down the street had a toy poodle. And I used to go there and play with him because my mom and dad said, you're allergic to dogs and cats. You can't have any. So what the, did I have for pets? Turtles, tortoises, um, lizards, <laughs> um, fish, things that you couldn't really get cuddly with because they're not cuddly creatures. They're yeah. cold-blooded, you know, even though nowadays turtles and tortoises are much more, we've brought them up into in a way where they're much more, you know, we have greater respect for them. But back then it was like not big deal. And I used to go play with his dog. And there's this one day I was there. I threw the ball and he brought it back. He, I threw the ball. I then went gestured like I threw the ball. And then I put it behind my back. The, the poodle took two steps forward, turned around, came back two steps, sat down, looked me straight in the gosh darn <laughs> eyes and said this. And said, I'm going to teach you a lesson you're never going to forget. And I kid you not, I heard those God, those words. He jumped up and bit me right here oh, in the right cheek. Ouch. And I literally have a picture of myself as a kid with two upper upper canine puncture wounds and one third lower canine, lower can, uh, puncture wound from his lower jaw there and seven stitches across. Oh. Now I'll ask you this. How many times have you heard somebody say, my child's been traumatized by a dog bite or a dog attack? Every time any, yeah, they, my, my child's going to, what do you think the hell happened to me after that? Did I get afraid of dogs? Did I get afraid of my parents, friends who had dogs and, or cats and stuff? No. Why? Because at the tender age of five, I had that dog tell me something, which was respect animals. Mm -hmm. Don't pester them. Don't torment them. And do not, most importantly, tease them. Because the credit you don't give them is far beyond the credit, the intelligence they possess. And that dog, that little black poodle, and my mom said, we're going to do that. I said, no, mom, you're not going to sue them. No, mom, you're not going to have them impound and kill the dog. I said, no. I said, it's my fault. Now, what kind of a five-year-old was astute enough to take that incident and process it in your brain enough to realize that take responsibility for your actions, don't blame others, don't blame animals for your lack of respect, because if you show them lack of respect, whatever takes place after that boundary, after that line is crossed, is on you, not on them. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't pay attention to their warning signs, to their communicative skills, and their ability to, to be sentient beings. And every time I read, you know, this is a sentient being, like, that stupid assholes don't understand. All creatures are sentient. Whether you want to expose it to the knowledge and expertise and fields of expertise that you think you can quantify the ability for them to be measured if they're sentient or not because they can see the reflection in a freaking mirror, that makes them sentient? 
the donkey dick son of a bitch scientist that said that I'd like to pop him in the, in the nose and say, you're a fucking moron. Just because they can't understand the reflection in the mirror does not mean they are not sentient beings. Yep. The idea that they have to have cognitive skills to look in the mirror to see themselves means they're sentient. It's like, you're a stupid idiot. They don't understand what the, what it is. Doesn't mean that they can't have sentient thoughts and feelings. And just because you can't comprehend them, don't degrade them as such as a lower life form because you think they can't be what they are. Because your ego speak is killing me. And I said, God damn it. I know a goddamn rattlesnake that I saw a couple of years ago in the middle of the night driving up Cielo. And I saw what I thought was, a, I, I drew by, I thought it was a stick in the road. Mm-hmm. And I pulled over and said, I got to get that stick out of the road. So he drives over and ends up popping it up into his gosh darn under the undercarriage of the car and does damage. So I pull over, I get out and I go up and I go, oh, it's not a, it's not a stick. It's a snake. It's 11 o'clock at night. It was like 100 degrees during the day. So the freaking pavement's still warm. And the, the reptiles can get around in that weather because they're not they're cold blooded. But since the ground is warm enough, it's radiating heat for them to, to work with and to warm their blood up. So I walked up to the snake and I didn't notice anything out of the order. It was a three foot snake. And I said, sweetheart, I said, you got to get across the road. We get across the road. And then it, up its tail went and start rattling. And I looked at it, not literally within a goddamn strike of that snake. Yeah. I'm literally like a foot away from it. I didn't see the rattle. I didn't, it was semi dark. I couldn't see the rattle. And he raised it. I said, I said, sweetheart. And I didn't like, oh, oh, snake, give me a stick. Let me kill it. Yeah. I said, sweetheart, I know you're a goddamn rattlesnake. We cut the crap. Do you think I'd give a damn? I said, I'm here for your benefit. Put his tail down. I said, now will you get the hell into the bush and take care of some of the rodents? And he slithered into the, into the brush. Tell me something. How many times have you heard people ever show a bit of respect for a rattlesnake? Yeah. <laughs> Any snake because of fear. And my thought was, I, as, as I had the experience, I said, you know something? I said, that was amazing. He could have felt threatened, but he didn't. Mm-hmm. He felt the energy that I was, the vibe I was giving off. And I was like, look, sweet, I got that. I know that you're a, you're a poisonous snake. Ooh. I said, I'm not here to hurt you. I said, I want you to go on with your life. And it respectfully understood and made his way across. He could have coiled up and felt threatened if he did yep. and struck me and taken me right out right there. Didn't happen. And that's why I said the same with the Ravens. I mean, you got to have a certain amount of respect for creatures, big and small. And even nowadays, when I used to, you know, when I, when I step on a snail, I feel terrible because whether you like it or not, it's a life. I know that you call them pests. But I mean, look, I'm not fond of ants and I try to keep them out of my house without hurting them. But it's like, you know, but it's not my malicious attempt to go out there and pour salt on snails in my garden because I couldn't care less. The, th- the plants will survive. They'll grow back. The snails have their right to be. And why should I sit there and try to put them out? And, you know, they're on my rose bush. OK, big deal. I pick them up and I move them over to something else. It's affording somebody respect that otherwise wouldn't be get- garnered that. So most people don't do that. No kidding. Nope. That's why, as I said, when I was a kid the, in, in junior high school, they had the list of the 50, of the, of the 50 freshmen and this and that. And each one had a title next to, or name next to them. And mine was unique. When I saw that, I said, <laughs> I said, good. I certainly wouldn't want to be anything, but I said to be like you assholes, I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> I'll stick with unique, a breed apart and smarter than thee, please. Or correct, it's all right, wiser than the smartness has nothing to do with it. Wise wisdom is much more valuable than smarts. Because if you're wise enough to understand the experiences you've learned through your through the times that you've lived, you're going to be a better person and undoubtedly smarter for it because you learned from your experiences and made good use of them. Totally agree. Let's talk about your book and the movie. Well, the move, the book, um, this bad boy, Ghost of Cielo Drive is a, <laughs> his, is, it took me about, probably about, I want to say about 10 to maybe 12, maybe 14 years total to actually get it to where it is. Oh, wow. And the irony is, is when Quentin Tarantino was up here five years, five years, six years ago, 2018, he was shooting, right? Yeah. 
When he was here six years ago in 2018 shooting Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that's what got me off my ass and made it happen. Literally, I mean, I had written down paragraphs and pages through the years and had this desire to put the story of the experiences in the house into written form. And mind you, after my my experience with Zach Baggins on Ghost Adventures 10 years ago, it really came like I have to put this down because excuse me, put it down on paper because so many people had taken to truth, taken to heart what he had printed in his book, I Am Haunted, and also in his show, um, Ghost Adventures, and then the follow-up show, Aftershocks, about me in the house. And I said, you know something? What he's put out there is so fraudulent and so, not only misconstrued, but it's so misinformed. It's, it's, misinforma it's misinformation for the public, and the public will eat it up. And as the old saying goes, a lie goes around the world in a matter of seconds the truth takes forever to make its way around the, the globe. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know something, people are calling out, calling me and asking me, how does it feel to live on Native American, in, in, was Native American ceremonial Indian burial grounds? And I'm like, it, it, it's not. One guy supposedly, we don't even know for sure, 300 years ago or so, died by accident when he fell down the slope of the hill and broke his neck with his horse and the remains were left on the side of the hill and buried and interred in the earth. And I didn't tell anybody for a number of seven, eight years after this was info information was in part to me by Lisa Williams when she came to visit in 2006 and said, there's a native American on horseback that's buried in this mound of earth under the house. And I was like, okay, I'm not telling anybody this. So let's see what other psychics have to say and other people have come in. And through the years, it was like eerie because at the time when Lisa was here, there wasn't a big internet presence, and she certainly wasn't publishing this no, no, yeah, the no, the notion that the house was built on this, on where this gentleman had died. And I was like getting feedback from other people, like Jackie Barrett, and who was the runner-up from America's Psychic Challenge, the TV show, um, James Von Prague, Chris Fleming. These are other famous television personality psychics that have been here. And, and, and thousands of thousands, hundreds of other people that have come in and said, I, I feel Native American energy in this in here. I'm like, well, and I'm thinking, Native American, what the hell are you talking about? This is the this is the hills of LA. But turns out, with a little research, I found out that yeah, the whole gosh darn county was covered with Native Americans. Diff not different tribes, but LA County was occupied by some, but something called the Tongva tribe. Yes, the Chumash were up further to the coast and were the coastal, the, the Native Americans that inhabited the coastline and were fishermen, but the Tongva lived inland and occupied a huge swath of land. I mean, just an enormous amount. Most of LA County going into Orange County was their territory. And I then found out that a mile away from my house in 1842, well, correction, 1925, that when they built the Beverly Hills First Women's Club, they found the remains of three Native Americans buried on the spot from a battle that took place in 1842, some that did a 70, 83 years earlier on that spot, when that spot was just part of this big walnut orchard that was part of the 4,500 acre, um, what was it called again, the Ranchero, that was owned by this woman, that husband was a captain in the Mexican army, and he was killed, and she inherited that from him, and she owned this huge plot of land, which was just like, when you look at it on a map, you go, that's, that's enormous. And what had happened was, is that the Native Americans had been displaced early on when the Mexicans, when the Spaniards came in and then the Mexicans colonized Southern California, they basically turned the place into farmlands and um, herd lands and, you know, what do you call it? Um, the orchards and stuff, and they developed it and they refined it. Hmm. So the Native Americans were basically pushed into the lesser viable interested areas, which were the hills and the mountains around here. Mm -hmm. Apparently in 1842, on one of the Native Americans, the group, the Tongvers 
Tongva tribe came down and made a raid on her ranchero, which sat at Alpine and Sunset Boulevard. And this time, apparently, her ranch hands were prepared and basically caught them in the act of trying to steal some of the goats and some of the, uh, the, the, the some of the livestock that they had on the property. And a running gun battle then ensued. Mind you, in 1842, they didn't have repeating rifles, so these were all muskets. Not muskets, they were flintlock. Not flintlock, dumbasses. They were right. They were. They were not. They were not cartridge rifles. So they had to literally ramrod the the powder and the bullets down there, et cetera, et cetera. So this battle ended up starting at the ranchero and ended at in the middle of the walnut grove. And three of the Native Americans were killed on the spot and buried there. So a few years later, found the bodies. And I did all the research in the book, and I was like, "Hey, oh boy." So that every person that had been here through the years before I found this information out, mentioning Native Americans, I feel Native American energies, and I'm like dismissive as hell. Turns out that every single one of them was white on the money with the proof is in the pudding. Hmm. So, you know, when I told Mr. Baggins in the show, he turned around and coined the house is built on Native ceremonial burial grounds. And at that point, when Scott Michaels of Dearly Departed Tours said to me on the Bridge of Marquardt, um, ghost, was it Ghosty, not Ghosty Girls, um, what was it, Ghost Magnet show that we were shooting here, said that on the air. I said, where the hell did you hear that? We were off guys. Where did you hear those? Oh, Zach Baggins told me. And I just just was like, what the hell? I said, the guy doesn't even have a have a high school diploma, I don't think. I know he didn't go to college. And that's your goddamn resource for this? I said, and I've known you for how many years, Scott? And you're sitting there telling me this hokey pokey BS that he told you, you believe? He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, Scott, I built the goddamn house. I think I know what's going on here. And I think I know the story that he's relaying that he twisted and turned into. I said, that's it. I got to write this God, you know, what book? Because it's enough. When somebody I know that knows me tells me something that he's regurgitating from you know who, and I'm like... You're spreading such blasphemous bullshit rumors. I'm getting tired of it. And I don't want the goddamn U.S. Department of um, the Interior, who does Native, Amer Native American affairs works, mm -hmm. coming in here and then d d demolishing, in, you know, turning up the earth in there to find that there's nothing in there. Or if they do find a bone and then saying this is a Native American, you know, ser ser burial site, blah, 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 blah. And then you know, the whole thing gets taken by eminent domain and they tear the house down because it's a cultural significant location. Because it would be a first because the Native Americans, as I did research, they didn't bury their dead on the side of the mountain. Maybe on top of the flat part of the mountain, but never so much so as to need to require to use out-of-the-way spaces and places to go out to bury their dead. Because the last time I remember hearing something about it, and after I, you know, about the um, Native American burial grounds, the only one I heard about was over in West LA, right next to the gosh darn 405 freeway a few years ago. And they literally had to stop construction of the freeway, in, you know, extension with widening of it to go in there and to look at it. And there was a whole mass Native American Tongva tribe grave there. And as I did research for the book, I was saying, let me see something. If in 1925, it was news about that unturning of the bodies, which it was, I said, how much, how come I can't find anything there in the news that would have made news about discovery of bones? Because in those days, up until 1977, there wasn't the American, was it the American, Native American Repatriation Act, mm -hmm. which said, Upon discovery of Native American bones on any location, they have to stop the construction, disinter the burial, the, 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 the remains, and reinter them in a ceremony governed by governed and governed by that tribe's elders or whatever. They had to do it, it had to be done. So it wouldn't have been a big hardship for someone to say, Yeah, we found some bones here. It's a news story. There weren't any up here in Benedict Canyon of anything through the years. So the fact is, is they weren't making burial sites where people have homes now that we know of, and certainly not here at my house. 
So the idea was that, you know, I have to make this book and write it. When Quint was here working after two days, I kept on just hanging around and Sharon, I kept on hearing Sharon spirit saying, he says, you are going to write that book now or else, <laughs> or else she goes, you can't wait anymore. You have to. And it's like, all right, you know, I finally got to the point where I said, it was inspirational having Quentin here and having them shoot the movie here, but it really pushed me to make the move to finish the book. And I did literally within six months, I finished the whole gosh darn book and I put it together. I was working with an, a publisher who was working with uh, Diane Lake the ex Manson family member who she had commissioned and published her book saying member of the family. She also had a book that was under published that she was publishing. That was the behind the scenes, the, the inside the trial of the Manson murders, which was the diary of the jury foreman from the Manson trial who had written an extensive detailed diary and his daughter or son found it after he had died and they, you know, years later, and they turned it into a, a book. I was supposed to be the third part of that because one's during the trial, one's from the inside perspective of the family, and the mind's the aftermath, you know, so there's supposed to be a trio of books. But due to the fact that I just could not get on the same page <laughs> with the uh, publisher, I ended up saying, you know, saying, I'm going to do it my freaking self. So I self published it, it's under the Omen House Publishing. And unfortunately, right now, I'm waiting for my the printer whose backlog says it'll be three to four weeks so we can get your 400, no, 500 copies out because we have so many things backed up that they're still catching up on from COVID. I said, really? He goes, oh, God. Wow. We're still, we've got, we got busier than hell because of from the backlog of COVID, things came in. And he says, we're still busy, 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 busier than ever before. So this is going to be a four-week. It's like, great. So I don't have copies presently available. The movie, which was shot a number of years ago, yes, unfortunately it was, um, was completely inspired by Sharon's spirit. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Got that. Back that up. All right. She, she just said, she goes, that's a lie. <laughs> she goes, it's not completely. Quickly, goes, I just want to know, when, did you, when were you able to start uh, communicating with Sharon Tate? Uh... It's either Sharon or somebody else. Again, I, I always defer to Sharon when I think it's her because I feel that 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 certain signature of hers. Mm -hmm. You bet your ass, kiddo. You, I know you. <laughs> she goes, I know you too. Thank you. We got that out of the way. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just, it's just like I said. Since obviously, from the, I, it seems like from the get go, from when I first came up here when I was a kid. You know, when I was, the first thing I did was, I'm not going to sit there and start sipping a beer and smoking a joint with you guys. There's no point. I said, I can't do this and with clear conscience without first showing respect to those. I think that's really what really kicked it off. Yep. Um, and also something funny going back to them. I have a better, <laughs> I have a more direct connection to the fan, to the Manson family personally than much of than more than alive than alive than Sharon Tate dead. Meaning in that when I was a kid, we I grew up in the hills not too far away from here, not two miles west in Bel Air. And um, one of our neighbors was Jan Barry of Jan and Dean, who were the oh. precursors to the Beach Boys. Yeah. And they were the original Southern California um, surf music duo. And Jan Berry had an accident in 1966, I do believe, on Dead Man's Curve, Sunset Boulevard, and wasted his Corvette and had severe head trauma and brain injuries. Well, my mom in, in the late 60s used to give hitchhikers rides, and they were always women, because at the bottom of Bellagio, where we lived, the bottom of the hills, we called it, was Sepulveda Boulevard and Bellagio and uh, Church Lane. And when you go up the hill, there are two cars length, there are two car widths wide and a little parking side on each side, pretty much. But they're treacherous in the fact that they're sharp curves. It's not terribly steep, but it's not a level, it's not level, and it's what twisty and windy. And so my mom had always seen kids walking up and she always got afraid and she, of something, somebody hitting them and stuff, and some terrible tragedy befalling them. So when she was at the bottom going up, she would always stop to pick up hitchhikers that were going up 
up uh, Bellagio. So she used to pick up these, pick up different girls and stuff. And, and I would be in the, sometimes I'd be with her in front seat of the car. And I used to turn around and my mom, again, this sounds totally whack for the present day, but back in the day before the murders, there was a sense of innocence and a sense of trust and a complete different sense of community in the time. And what I'm saying and trying to get at is <clears throat> many people used to hitchhike back in the day without fear of anything. They weren't fe fearful of being abducted or killed or kidnapped or anything like that. So, and the same thing for my mother with hitchhikers. We weren't, there wasn't a fear that somebody's going to rob you blind and steal your car and stuff. Nowadays, it's unheard of. Yes. But again, 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 again. That was how it was then. And people present day not understanding is how could that is it? Because times were different. Yes, and those were. of you that look at the present day and look backwards and have no basis or reference of what it was like might find it squirrely, queer, or uh, just out, out of the fathom of, of is this really happening? Yes, people used to hitchhike and it wasn't a big to do. So I'd be in the front seat and I looked at these girls and my mom said, this is my son, David. I'm Mrs. Omen. Da, 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 and just talking her freaking ass off. Like she was like <laughs> making friends because again, it wasn't a fear-based existence. So she gets to the house where we live and she goes, girls, this is as far as I go. And then she literally would say, this is my house and point the freaking house out to them. You wouldn't do that today. Like, across the street, or I live on this. But literally, said, this is my house. This is as far as I go. And had to go into great detail of explaining what the hell. And she says, look, you've gotten out of the most da dangerous part of the trek. Coming up here, Jans is now just about a half a mile up. And the street's not too, too difficult. It's not. It's like you're on the top of the mountain. So it's flat and level. It's a slight grade. So they would sit there and said, thank you, Mrs. Oman. Nice to meet you, David. And I kept on looking at them. And there was something in my head that said, I'm looking at these girls straight in the eyes. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm like a kid going uh, like under six, going, there's something weird about these, these girls. I don't know what it is. I've been around kids that were their age because my sister and her friends were older. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen this look in their, somebody's eyes until – Fast forward like 19, mid 70s when the Hare Krishnas, which was a group of religious zealots, they used to wear, what do you call them, tunics or for lack of better word, togas, and go through the airports with symbols in their hands, clinking, clanking the symbols and asking for donations. And they had this weird 10,000 mile stare in their eyes, meaning you could look at them, but you couldn't get a fix on anything that's going on inside their head. It was like a distant look. And I know people don't, the younger generation don't understand. It's like they're there, but there's something missing. There's just something not straight and, and narrow. Not good, not bad, just weird. So, you know, after the Manson murders took place, she stops giving hitchhikers rides. Fast forward to 1970, July I wake up at the morning in the morning at eight in the morning. I go into the kitchen and I notice that the sliding glass door leading out to the patio and swing pool is open two feet. And I'm like, wait a second. Mm. The, the house rule is the last person in the kitchen has got to make sure that the and again, after the murders, everybody went on panic mode and was locking their doors, you know, getting security alarms, getting guns, getting guard dogs. So the, the least we none of that shit did my family do. There wasn't a guard dog. There wasn't an alarm. There wasn't any gosh darn guns in the house. Not even a BB gun. And my mom just made sure the doors were locked. So she says the family rule was between me, my sister, my dad, and my mom was the last person in the kitchen must make sure that all the doors and windows are locked. And the night before, I remember that was me. Because I had gone in there at 10 o'clock to get something to eat because I was star hungry. And my mom, you know, said, David, if you're going to the kitchen, you may. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. So I'm looking. I said, that doesn't. And then I look outside around the patio. And that's when I noticed my dad's slacks were over the gosh darn railing around the swing pool. I, I think my mom's purse was off to the right on one of the, on the, one of the bushes that was there. I then look, looking around outside, I noticed that something was glinting on the patio table. And I'm like, what the hell? So I go outside and I see this Sara Lee coffee cake tin on the damn table 
there's a piece where you can see there's a piece that's been taken, cut out, and it's sitting on this little plate, little coffee t- cup plate next to it, and there's a bite out, bite chunk of a bite out of it. And then I noticed this craft single, a, one single piece of craft American cheese that's 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 there. The piece that, that you lift up has been torn out. And the cellophane that's covering both sides and, and, and it's still stuck together is still there. And I go run into my parents' bedrooms. I wake them up and I said, Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad, come here quick. And again, this is 19. So nobody's read, nobody knows anything about the Manson family's trials and tribulations and what they were doing, their occurrences. And I'm sitting there and my mom says, Jesus Christ, somebody at the hell came in the house in the middle of the night while we were asleep. And she goes, my purse was on the nightstand right next to where I, right next to the bed, which I was sleeping in in my bedroom. My dad slacks were over the gosh darn little his sofa chair there that was right next to the goddamn bed as well. So they were in their room. Somebody came in the house, went around the parents where they were sleeping, didn't wake them up. Me, I'm in me, I'm in my other bedroom. My sister's in her bedroom. And none of us are the wiser. And my mom says, It's a good thing, David, you didn't have one of your sleepwalking attacks. Because I was prone to sleepwalking as a kid. Mm-hmm. And literally, they'd find me in the living room and say, David, you know, I don't know. I said, you're asleep on the, on the couch in the living room. What are you doing? It's like, so my mom says, God damn, that's the luckiest thing I've ever seen. Fast forward to reading Helter Skelter. Get to the chapter where it called, talks about Creepy Crawl, where Manson had basically instructed the family members to go into people's homes and... As he said, leave signs that you were there, but do not disturb the occupants. This isn't to hurt anybody. This is just honing your skills to be able to do these kind of night maneuvers. That's terrifying. They would, people, they would go into people's houses while they were sleeping and go into the room where they were sleeping, get as close as they could to where the people were in beds asleep and take things, remove them, and put them in places where they shouldn't have been to let leave telltale signs mm-hmm. that they had been in the house while these people were asleep to scare the shit out of the people that were there, which undoubtedly it did. And then it was like, I, I was like, oh, I said, wait a second. Um, hello, who was my mother giving hitchhiking rides to? Who was going to see mm-hmm. Janet Berry? And doesn't that exactly fit into the modus operandi, for those that don't understand, the method and operations is what that translates to from Latin of the Manson family. And when I'm reading, you know, creepy crawl and I show my mom, she goes, Oh crap. Because that makes sense because everything that was in the book was what happened to us some seven, eight years earlier in my own home. Terrifying. And then when, when I was working with the publisher, she brought Diane Lake. She was out here with Diane was visiting from the East. No, no, the publisher was visiting Diane from the East coast and brought Diane to the house and I'm here. And I'm like, when I said, I can't imagine what the hell maelstrom of crap I'm going to endure from the spirits having her walk in. And as it turns out, nothing happened. And I kept hearing the spirit says, no, why would we have any antipathy antipathy towards her? They said, if it wasn't for her, our story would never, we would have never had the Vic. We would have never been, we would never have had any sense of, Redemption, because she turned state's evidence and basically fingered Manson and the family for what happened. So I was like, like, wow, this is a trip. I said, that's amazing. You guys goes, no, she's good with us. We really, you know, we have to thank her because she went out of her way to stand up for their, you know, for, for what was right and for their memory. And as far so back to the so back to the, the story of the, of the movie. Um, <laughs> about twenty years ago, I'm down the driveway, about hundred feet from the house, not even, and I'm standing under this huge holly oak that's growing out of the side of the hill. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, out I said, "What the hell am I going to do? I'm at the crossroads of my life." I can't, I, I, I don't, did this and this. I've done this. I've done a restaurant. I've owned a restaurant with my partner. I've tried my hand at acting. I've tried my hand at being a dog walker. I've tried my hand for 20 years at being a private investigator. I said, you know, so I just have no clue where the hell I'm going. And this is just so 
so much meandering through life and trying to find a vocation where everybody's like, I do this and that's all I do. And I have always been a person that's never been satisfied with just doing one thing. I want to be a more well-rounded person and it never was like in my hardwiring of my brain that I wanted to be working a corporate job. And I'm thinking, you know, I could never work in this environment. I can't work this nine to five with the stiff after, you know, putting on the suit and the tie and the whole nine yards in corporate America. And all of a sudden I see this in my mind's eye, this little mini movie, as I'll describe it, playing out in my head of me or a guy that looks like me driving up in a convertible 64 Mustang coming up the driveway as I'm passing the second house. I turned to my left and I noticed there's this girl and she's, she it doesn't look like Sharon Tate, but it looks like Sharon Tate, but I'm not thinking it's Sharon. I'm just seeing this. She's, but she's dressed to the nines in sixties attire. And as I'm, as, as, the, as, as my character turns and looks at her, it's like, Holy hell. She is one. Wow. She's beautiful. She's dressed to the nines in sixties attire. And I'm like thinking this is present day. What the hell is this? As I turn to look to my to, to rearrange my sight line from to the left, as I turn to, to turn straight ahead to look through the windshield, I notice I'm about to go right off the guy's oh. turn side the, <laughs> down. So it's like no, and I turn the steering wheel as hard to the right, and I just hit the 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 um, the bump, you know, the the, road, the side of the road where it's a little bit of a lip, mm-hmm. and I correct the steering, and I'm going straight up, and then it cuts to and mind you, this this whole vignette plays out in my mind's eye. In less than half the time I'm saying, describing it, mind you, it was like a 10 second, 15 second vignette. And I'm like, going, and I'm watching it totally mesmerized by what's going on in my eyes, in my head. I'm going, and I'm thinking, okay, just go with it. Just go, go, let it play out. It's not going to hurt you. It then cuts to the gosh darn side camera in the passenger seat. And as it pans across the, the, the profile of my face, it then leads into the rear view mirror, and then you see the rear view mirror of the car, and there's nothing in the rear view mirror there. She's not there. And I and it cuts right down, like, and I'm like, okay. And I'm f- fully tripping balls, going, okay, what the hell was that? And I'm saying it out like I said, I said, okay, I saw that. I saw that. I said, what the hell was that? And I'm a little bit like concerned, going, but the very first time it's happened to me in this situation. And I said, okay, what? The hell, and this voice says, it's for you to, it's a gift. You're to go back and write down what you saw in detail and and just keep it. And I'm like, what? And what the, he says, it's a gift. He goes, you're going to, this and it's something to the effect that this is a gift. It's a movie you're going to make and you're going to star in it. And I'm like, who the hell? And I, I said, I said, I said, I, 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 I said, who the hell is this? I said, who is this that I hear in my ear because it's clear as a bell? And I, what I just experienced, I've never had that before. And the voice says, it's Sharon. And I'm like, Sharon who? I don't know anybody named Sharon. And as I said, I don't know anybody named Sharon. It's like the bricks come tumbling down on your head and said, excuse me, where do you live? I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, no <laughs> way. You, yeah. Sharon? Sharon isn't Sharon from down the street from my house. Sharon isn't Sharon Tate. And I'm like flabbergasted. I'm going, yeah, right. Okay. Okay. And I said, all right, fine. I can't argue with this because every time I argue with my, my, my guides telling me, don't take her home. Let Glenn take her home. He, she lives next door to Glenn. You don't have to do it. And if you do, and I did, you end up totaling your car. And it's like, well, I learned from my interdimensional experiences through the, through my life where they said, don't do this. Don't go visit your friend. If you do, you're going to get a speeding ticket. And sure enough, I did that one again. Another, it's, it's like, okay, I learned. Yeah, I got the speeding ticket. You sense it. You know what we're running. <laughs> so it's like, I said, what have I got to lose by doing this and honoring and, and humoring her? Because it was really, I didn't know what the hell this was. So I write this down. And after like three or four months of, of literally having these vignettes pop up into my head, and I'm like, okay, I know what I got to do. I got, I, I'll pay attention. I'll pay attention. I literally have to focus on the scene that I'm watching and I have to go back and I got to write it down because as soon as it's in that head of mine, if I don't process it quickly, something detail is going to be missing. So after three or four months, I've got literally my legal pad filled up with four, four lines of, in, of, of a, one paragraph, six lines for another, 10 for another, of vignettes. And I'm like, God 
damn, I got 40 vignettes. And I'm going, what is this all? I don't, I don't understand it. They, it's not like it's a limit as I guess a story. It's just like bits and pieces of a puzzle. And you're basically given the job to create a, a clean, a clear puzzle from these pieces as you try to put them together. So I said, I, I, I don't understand. I'm so I am, I'm dumb, whatever you want to say. So I called a friend of mine up, Jim Vines, who was a screenwriter. And I'll never forget Jimmy. And I'm sure this, he, if he ever hears this, he'll say, yeah, that's me. Uh, he, he says, he goes, yeah, I can help you. He says, but I'm not, I don't work for free. And I'm like, Jimmy, we've known each other for 20 so on. Come on. We've known each other for kids. Come on. Better. No, he goes, but you can do this. It wasn't just the dinner. He wanted money too. I had to make him a gosh darn, some kind of a fancy ass dinner and give him a, a hundred and some a hundred bucks to take the time to read my gosh darn drivel, as he called it. <laughs> he saw it. After he goes through it, and we were we spent like like three, four hours working on this, and it was still worth it, every penny. He goes, You know what you got here? He said, What do you think I called you up? He goes, You've got what writers call um, you've brainstormed brainstormed. I said, What is it? He goes, sometimes when writers have writer's block, they will stop in the middle of what they're they will stop at the block and go ahead in this in this in the storyline and address something else future. And he says, and then they'll skip around and they'll have these things, and then they'll go back to the writer's block problem and it'll work. I said, what he goes, it'll work itself out. He says, How's it? Because you will have addressed the issue down the road from a different perspective. You have to make the bridge of continuity. At that point, and it'll all figure itself out. I said, I said, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, we got 40 scenes here of a movie that are all out of order. I said, what? He goes, we have to literally take the gosh darn legal pad and cut this, the paragraphs up and label them one, two, three, and we'll, we'll figure, or ABC, and we'll, we'll figure out and how we can make this into a cohesive story. I said, really? He goes, oh, yeah. And he goes, this is amazing. What you've done here is really you know, I said, Jimmy, I, I, I told him, he goes, that's crazy. I said, but who cares? Let's do it. Let's see. And we spent about six months, I think it was like six or eight months arguing back and forth because he has a totally different perspective than my own. And it was like, all right, fine. So we created the screenplay. And literally, I went to my mom. I told her she was, you know, dealing with her pancreatic cancer. Mm. And I begged her. I said, this is going to be a big to do. I tell you, Ma, I'm telling you. I said, this is the, the source and the origins was Sharon. And she didn't believe any of that. My mom couldn't care less, you know, but she liked the idea. And she said, you know, something, I'll, I'll do something. I'll get, I'll, I'll front you the money to make the movie. And she goes, but this is coming out of whatever inheritance there is of yours, which turned out to be not much because my sister took most of it or got most of it because you gave it to her. That's why she got most of it, isn't it, Ma? Thanks. Nothing like giving a little to your daughter because she had two kids and that was a success. And I didn't have any. So, all right, fine. Let, leave that and be that as it may. Um, I, I got her to give me the 300000 to do it. I got some other money from some other people, about a half a million dollars total. And we made the motion picture. And she said, I want Paul Mason, who was a dear friend of the family. He was worked at um, Screen Gems as, as the exec as the president for Screen Gems for a number of years. And he was a family friend. And she goes, I trust Paul. He's made and made motion pictures. He's made work at ABC. He's worked around. He's got a great track record. Bring him in. Let's have Paul get in. So we literally had Paul come in and he became the executive producer. My godfather became the other executive producer. And our attorney for the movie became the other executive producer. And I think my father was also titled as exec producer. And I was the producer, creator, and co-writer of the movie. Mm. And the only thing that I didn't do that I think was part of the problem why things took are taking so long is when people see the movie and know me or have an idea about me, they said, he's playing you. And I go reluctantly, it's like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> and they said, so how come you didn't play you? I said, because <laughs> my casting director and my producer – and the director didn't think I had the chops. And I said, looking back on it now, I would have shot them a, a, a glare across the bow saying, who the hell is putting up the money here? If I'm putting up the money and my instructions were to play this, the role of myself in the movie by the person who, or the spirit that gave me the story, 
why am I going to betray that trust and confidence? And that's where I didn't follow through with what I promised Sharon that I would do because she said, because you play yourself, you know it better than anybody else, and you're a talented enough individual when it came to your skill as being an actor to be able to nail this. I couldn't convince the three other assholes in the room at the time, and we ended up with this other guy. Originally, you'll get this. This will be a kick. We cast the role for the lead to play me. Get this. Um, you've heard of, what is it, uh, Mellow Yellow, the song Mellow Yellow yeah. from the 60s? Yep. Sung by Donovan and, of course, Season of the Witch. Mm-hmm. We had Donovan Leach Jr. slated to be the goddamn character. Wow. And he had to bow out because his actress wife was giving birth to their first child. Oh. And she didn't want him. Even though we were shooting here in L.A. and it was a short three-week shoot schedule, that she didn't want him to do it and had to ask him to bow out. So he took our second stringer and we still didn't take me, which I would have been the better of the three because we would have got, I would have hired Heather Graham to play the Sharon Tate role because I thought Heather Graham had that look. She had the sense of, she could convey that tremendous sense of innocence. And I remember from, from when she did, uh, well, Boogie Nights, that character that she played was, was completely so organic and so real of the sense of innocence of the actual, because Roller Girl was a real girl. I found out oh, really? when I looked up online, it's like, oh yeah, that porn star Roller Girl was known for having sex in a roller <laughs> skate. <laughs> for real. She was, she, that, a lot of the characters in that Boogie Nights were based on real pe- personalities of the hmm. time. They changed the name, obviously, but obviously, in her yeah. case, they didn't have to give a shit. For John Holmes, they did. But the point was, I liked the fact that she conveyed that sense of innocence that I don't personally think Margot Robbie had or ever will have to play the role of Sharon Tate in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I watched, I never saw it because I never had any interest because it's Sharon said, because it's exploitive of our story in a different light. And I'm not happy about it. So I never would see it for that. But I mean, when, when I saw Margot when she was shooting here and I walked by her, you know, when there was nobody around, Sharon couldn't have been more couldn't have been more reticent and, and distant from that from her than than the man on the moon is to Earth. It was just it was no I saw nothing. Yeah, you made her look like her to a slight degree, but the content of this character was totally devoid of Sharon. And for 13 minutes on screen for a 190 minute motion picture, it was a blowjob. It was blown. It was a blow. It was a blow up. It was a pathetic thing because I said, she said, why aren't they having a good old fashioned casting call around the entire country to find the, the person to play me? She said, she goes, they could have done it. it would have been a great publicity hype and a great, great boost for yeah. sales of the movie because you would have all these kids that would have been looking. That, and what are you looking for? You're going to be on screen. We're going to give you your first screen role, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. But we want you to be almost a clone of Sharon to the point where if you do a three million person cattle call across the country and for six months, I'm almost positive they would have found somebody that looked and acted and had the essence of that character, Sharon, not (laughs) Margot Robbie, who, who, it, 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 as Sharon said, it was a shallow portrayal of me, period. Mm. It really was. And when I saw clips of it, I go, okay, that's nice. That's great. But for the amount of money and hype, something could have been done a much more different way, which would have really elicited a better thing. Because 13 minutes of a 190-minute motion picture is scant. And I'm not talking talking. I'm including nonverbal scenes of her walking around, her her B-roll shots of her in Western and stuff where she's not saying anything and stuff and she's in the movie theater. As I heard, she's eating popcorn, not saying a freaking word. Yeah, it would have been a much better thought because like I said, it really, she didn't catch it. She and no, And let's be honest, there was only one and only one Sharon Tate. But to do her a bit of respect and out of honor to her, somebody that could have been more applicable to the role and more fitting of the role that had that sense of naivete and that, um, that innocence would have been a much better cast role than that. And I'm sorry. I thought the guy that played Wojtek was incredibly sounded like, like not Wojtek, like, um, like uh, what's his face? Like Roman Plansky. 
was was dead on. It looked like him, except Roman's about a foot shorter than he was. And but the accents and everything, as they found out, they got a Polish actor to play the part of Roman, and he listened to a lot of the interviews with Roman, so he got the the dictum and the way he speaks down. Because I've heard Roman speak, and I heard the guy talking to the director when when they weren't shooting, when they were getting ready to shoot the the um, MG scene, when he's tearing down Cielo, and uh, he spins out, and he, he dro- I was watching that whole thing, and he was talking to the director. I was like, I said. If he was a foot shorter, I'd say he was Roman Polanski because hmm. he just he was just dead on. And I'm thinking, so how come you got some actress that couldn't hold a candle to Sharon playing Sharon then is what I didn't understand. Yep. Great for Barbie. Yay. But I don't want to see that as the goddamn portrayal of Sharon Tate for such an insignificant portion of a film for such a big blow to the, I trying to remember, I was like, well, that's great. You cast it, said that's terrific, but you had other stars in the entire freaking film that you didn't need to put her in a position of, de- you know, denigrating her, her perform, the, the 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 person by getting some of the, another big name. I said, like, you didn't need the big name. You had enough big names throughout the entire cast. She could have been the one that was the one that really brought the whole pro- production to another level by saying we're doing all this casting. Why? Because back in the '60s. That's what they did for cattle calls to find the next big star. They used to do those things. And the publicity that was generated from those cattle calls, the movie, when it came out, had a whole built in fan base long before it came into the pit movie, into the movie houses. Mm-hmm. And that's why I said, I said, God, and she kept saying, she goes, so Sharon kept saying, she goes, no. And I kept them thinking, you're right. There isn't. There's no comparison. It's not you. It's not even close. Is Sharon so, happy with the outcome of your movie? Yeah, she said yes, yes, with the exception of dot dot dot. You didn't play yourself. That's the only, and it wasn't myself. It's a fictional character. The whole story was fictionalized, which brings us back to what I decided to do, which people are pissing on me now for saying, "Why didn't you do Sharon? Why didn't you call her Sharon Tate? Why did you change the names?" And it's like because. I don't like taking historical figures, a.k.a. Um, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer, and creating a backstory that's so fictionalized and so comic book-esque that you, have to, you literally have delineated their character in history to a, to a joke. I don't want to do that. I didn't like Inglorious Bastards. I thought it was a great idea. But once you go to the place where you take historical figures and you put them into the scenes where they're getting annihilated by this Jewish commando group from the U.S., I go, you know, you lost me. I would have much preferred you guys fictionalize some of these names of these individuals and put them in that situation because I can buy into that. But once you take it and try to make it like it's historically, and it's like, what are you trying to rewrite history? This is what you wish happened? Your mm-hmm. fantasy is this? Well, let me get you straight. Your fantasy, unfortunately, provides a, a bad image for the younger viewers that don't have the sensibilities to do the research and take it as freaking fact and believe this is this. And how can I say that? Because after Once Upon a Time and Hollywood came out, we had at least a thousand freaking cars a day for the first month and a half coming up here at all hours of the night to go see Sharon's and ask me how many people said, where's Cliff and Witch McCall's house? Where's the driver to their house? And I have to explain to them, the movie's a fucking, is a fairy tale. You do understand she's dead in the ground since 1969 when she died. Mm-hmm. And people were like, no, where's Cliff's house? They said the house that they shot it in is over in Universal Studio in Universal City, some three and a half miles due east, as the crow flies. Mm-hmm. Because there are no houses up here. I said that have swimming pools on the side of the hill. Are you kidding? I said, where are we gonna put a swimming pool? You see these four houses? These are the only freaking houses up here. None of my neighbors or I have a swimming pool. Hmm. The guy at the end of the street has a swing pool because he's on a huge flat pad of land. And you should see, could it wouldn't believe the expression on the people's faces, like thinking it's somehow real. <laughs> I mean, that's why I don't like that. And I said, it, it's not only disrespectful to the memory of Sharon, but it brings more attention to, in my eyes back to Manson, which the reason why I wrote the movie was to honor and respect the memory of Sharon J. Vo- uh, vo- uh, was it Sharon J. Vo- uh, Sharon J. 
Abigail and Roman, even though Roman's alive, those are the four characters I represent in the movie. Mm -hmm. I didn't put Wojtek in and I didn't put Stephen Parent in. I also did not make Sharon Tate in my movie pregnant. I just didn't. It was, again, I, out of respect to the baby, to Sharon's memory, I didn't need to go out on a limb to be an exploitive piece of rat's ass crap. And that's why I kept on trying to take the high road. So after Charlie Manson dies, everybody feels the cat's out of the bag. We can now do these movies and make these, you know, these deli del deliberate attempts at explo exploiting the murders, such as the ghosts of, what was it, uh, Goes, well, I forgot the name of the haunting of Sharon Tate, which said that Sharon had, had visions of this and that. And all. <laughs> I mean, and then the, the, to the nth degree of what they did with the reenactment of the murders from the, the vision, the view of the murderers and then the view of the victims. I was like, it's sensationalistic, it's graphic gore in nature. And yeah, that's great. You can turn a buck on it. But at the end of the day, it's still a pile of shit. Because it's derisive, it's derisive, deliberate um, exploitation of that of that tragedy. And mm -hmm. I said, I can't do that. I can't do that for you. I said, you're too close to me, and I have too much respect for you in your memory. And I will not put Charlie Manson as the gosh darn executioner in my movie. I will not give him the motivation of Charles Manson and and his his ordeals and his thoughts. But I will do, and I will keep to the true story in a sense, meaning there are three female characters that play the murderesses, and there's one male character that's leading them. Mm -hmm. His name in the movie is, um, God, what's his name? Um, not Charles Foster Kane. Get out of here. Don't be funny. Don't do that to me. Don't slip the guy. Thank you. Appreciate that. What was they the said, name? Somebody's they said, they said, it's Charles Foster Kane, isn't it? I said, Charles, I said, that's Citizen Kane. His name was Henry Charles Packard. And his motivation is the fact that he's been sent off to Vietnam and he's dating the Sharon Kate, the, 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 the character that play, portrays the Sharon Tate character in the movie. And he's, a, he's, an, he's an aspiring screenwriter. So he's written a story, a screenplay called The Vampire Slayers. Oh. He's getting shipped out to Vietnam the night before he's the day before he's going. His girlfriend Claudia DeLongpre, who plays the Sharon Table, gets in, gets meets this produce this director, who's fond and hot for her, but she's involved with Henry, so she gets the invite to go to this big Hollywood swank party a few days before Henry's shipping out. She takes Henry as her date to the party. Mm -hmm. at Party. And then, now, now this is all backstory stuff. This is not part of the movie, so I'm not giving anything away. At the party, the director guy, um, De Henry, De Henry uh, what's him called, Mr. DeWitt, is fond on her. Every time Henry tries to take get a talk to him about his screenplay, the director DeWitt is like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And push keeps on blowing him off. She, he gets sent off to Vietnam. God, a couple of um, months later, she gets notified that he's been he's MIA, which stands for missing in action. And later on, it's they they decide it's KIA killed in action, which is far from the truth. He's in a North Korean hospital, been captured, and he's recuperating. And he finally escape, manages somehow to escape and gets back down to the south. He still does not turn in his dog tags because he doesn't want to go back to fighting in Vietnam. He's done with it. And somehow he, he's he's there in Vietnam and he reads a newspaper and he sees his ex-girlfriend or his girlfriend, he thinks is still his girlfriend, is starring in a movie called The Vampire Slayers. And he reads who's directing said movie, Mr. DeWitt, the guy who's already blown him off, that pissed all over him when he was there at the, at the party with her. And was all interested in his girlfriend, but nothing to do with him. And so he's got this level of anger and resentment on top of the fact that he's then reading that DeWitt and his girlfriend are engaged to be married. Oh, that's a kick in the teeth. And the fact that the son of a bitch, he thinks that his ex-girlfriend or his girlfriend has turned his gosh darn script to giving it to DeWitt to produce and to make. And he's been triple shafted. 
betrayed by, by his girlfriend, then by DeWitt, then by his girlfriend again, he gave him the, the screenplay and he's getting no credit mm -hmm. because in her eyes, he's dead. He doesn't know that she thinks he's dead and has gone with life and is doing it honestly to honor his memory because he's been killed. And there's, this is the last viable piece of material that he's left on the earth, according to her. And it, so that's the setup for why he's committing the murders. Okay. And in the, in the movie, we actually, he says there's, there's a line in the movie where the client, where the climax, where the, ends, where the high point between the confrontation between DeWitt and Henry Charles Packard back in 1969, he's before the murders take place. He goes, who's your girlfriend? He goes, where did you meet the star of vampire slayers? Was she my date? He says that one line because in that one sentence, he's explained the whole backstory without anybody knowing hmm. because, but you don't know it until you get into it. And then you go, Oh my God, that's, that's crazy. You see, that's what his motivation is devoid of world conquest and taking over and having, you know, being the leader of, of the, of the black contingents that were then running the world, according to good old Charlie Manson. I didn't want it. So we have three killer girls and a guy. The motivation is totally devoid. And the reason why, the murders in my movie are unsolved is because Henry Charles Packard and the three girls since 1969 have been going through the time portal that's on the property where Henry's, where, where Mr. DeWitt's house sat and sits. Hmm. Presently. It's a trip. It's a crazy, uniquely original story. I've had the people that have bought the movie have sent me responses and said, I loved it. I especially loved the, the cliffhanger ending. And I, again, from my perspective, I'm too vested into it. I've been in there, the, the trenches for so long that I don't know up from down and uh, in from out. So when you ask me about them, I don't know. They said to me, I like the gosh darn time travel. That was so unique and so interesting. The fact that they go back to the day of the murders and become the victims and have to figure their way out. And I, they just, it was just like so important for me to get feedback from a real audience and not from, God, for I say this, from taking this around to different people, different experts in the film industry. The Shantate name. What do you, I don't know. It's like because it's just, they don't get it. But the audience loves it and finds it interesting and original and fun. To me, it's like I've done a good job. And in regards to the fact that I didn't get to be, Myself in the movie, I had a few small cameos in it, but still, I made a mistake, Sharon. I apologize. I will never do it again or will never try to and never allow that to take place because, again, had I listened to her, we wouldn't be here today talking about this now. This would probably be talking about a, a, the, the television series or something that's born out of it. But because I took the long road to do it as, as far as what I was told to do and didn't, you know, it just takes that much longer. So in hopes that somebody out there listens to this and likes the movie and have to say, you know something? We want to do something with this this franchise if we could. Let's let's talk. I'd be tickled pink because it's been years in the making. And literally this in this final version is the tenth revision of the motion picture since it was originally shot. Literally, I kid you not, there are that many versions of the same picture. Yeah, and it's a lot of years I've spent doing it. And um, as the old saying goes, I'm pleased with it. I think the audience is happy with it. Everything came together, even though my executive, two of my executive producers have passed away. Paul Mason and my and Leonard Granger, my godfather, have both passed. I feel more so now confident that with the right audience and the right marketing that this thing could actually find a home where people say, Thank you for not naming Sharon in the movie because you didn't have to. We got the picture. We understand. So that I can basically say to those in the position of knowledge, quote unquote, that, you know something, I'm glad I did what I did, regardless of what you think now that I should have labeled her as Sharon Tate. Not to mention this. Do you know how difficult it is to really, really, really portray somebody that is a historical figure that is not so far removed from yourself where there's video footage and film footage. And you're not talking about Ben Franklin. You didn't know how he spoke because you didn't know how he sounded to, to be able to honor and really honestly, and I know this 
this a lot of filmmakers don't give a rat's ass about, but in my case, I have to because of my respect for her. It would have been next to impossible to find somebody because not only that, but for the other characters as well, for the Roman Polanski character, because I would have had to say Roman Polanski. I would have had to say Jay Sebring. I would have had to say Abigail Folger. And I said, I just didn't want that much weight of, on my shoulders and personal responsibility to get that exactly right, not for the audience, mind you, but out of respect for their spirits and their memory that the relatives of them would look at this and say, you got it. I just didn't want that pressure because that becomes the, the tightrope you have to walk to make everybody happy. And when you do that, in the end, you make nobody happy because you're making concessions to everyone along the way. And at the end, everybody's bitching at you for it. So I said, I'm not doing that. And especially because of their memory and how much respect I have for them as, as people, not footnotes to history, like they're treated like in a lot of cases today. To me, I consider them people that need to be respected and honored for who they were, not how the hell they died. Well, David, I think this is a good uh, point to end. We've been going for two hours. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. Before we sign off, though, could you tell the uh, listeners where they can find the movie? It's Well, you can go to house at the end of the drive.com. There's a link to the Vimeo site where it sits. It's a three day rental. It's three ninety nine, so it's it's about a buck thirty three per day. You can watch it as many times as you want, and I have a pretty good feeling from the people that have already seen it who have told me I had to watch it again. I said, "Really?" She goes, "I had to." I said, "When I got to the end of the first time I watched it, everything made sense. It all clicked." So I wanted to watch it again because now understanding the whole how it all works, I said, "I loved it." I said, "Well, God bless you." I said, "You know," he goes. And it's a fun movie. You know, I just, they kept saying this, it's a fun, interesting, entertaining piece of work. And I said, well, I, I appreciate your accolades and your um, interest in it. So, okay. And of course, go to youtube.com forward slash David Omen to see clips of the movie. And of course, to see videos that were actually captured here in the house of my unseen house guests doing their thing. And I mean, we have a video from three weeks ago where I had six social media influencers here. We're all in the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen. They're in the dining room. We're about 10 feet from the front door. I'm telling the story of the Lindsay Lohan visit from 13 years ago. And right as I said, when I opened the door, I looked at Lindsay and all of a sudden I felt like the air just left my tires. The front, the front door opened, unlocked, and opens itself up by itself oh, wow. there's no wind outside we have the outside cameras the two the left and the right front um front house cameras and the front door camera and there's no one there and there's no wind literally there's a two flower uh, rose bushes right next to the entrance and you can see the leaves on the on the, the petals and the leaves on the bush are stationary and when people have watched the video they said david you and the six people are standing there dumbstruck. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm listening very closely and I'm turning up my hi-fi so I can listen specifically to the acoustics. And he goes, yeah. He goes, I hear three steps before the door opens and no one's moving. And then after the door opens, I hear three steps going outside on the outside door camera. And the front door guy said, yeah, we can hear footsteps walking in and out of the house. I'm like, hey. He goes, oh yeah, it's clear wow. as a bell. And he goes, and you guys are all standing there like going, Dude, what's it with it? And I'm going, I don't know. I said, I didn't do anything. I don't know. And it's just, and again, we're not actively ghost hunting. We're just shooting the shit yeah. before dinner. And that happens. That's amazing. So check the, check the YouTube channel out. Like I said, subscribe, please. It helps. I'd like to invite you back so you can talk more about uh, actual activity that you have in your house. Oh, I'd be happy to. Yeah. God, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have so you. much. Like I said, it's 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 like I said, when you least expect it, when you're not looking, is when they like to let you know they're there. And it's like, one, well, all right, I heard, that. and I have to call them out because I don't feel comfortable if I just bury it under my cat and go, it'll beat my brains out. So I, say, all right, spirits, I saw that, or I heard that, and it's not out of fear; it's more out of acknowledgement to say, 
what do you think? I'm dumb. I didn't hear that. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. And I let him know. It's like, you want to keep doing that? Fine. It's not going to affect me. However, <laughs> as we know, sometimes it gets you going, all right, just, you got me, you scared me, you got me yeah. good there. That's it. <laughs> Next. So yeah, I'd be happy to come back on. Great. Well, thank you so very much, David. I really appreciate having you on. And My uh, pleasure, Kat. Thank you for having me, please. And like I said, to your audience, you want to come down and do a live couple of live shows and live streaming shows here, be my guest. It'll be a pleasure. Okay. I'll add links to where people can find you. Thanks again, David. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> Just not my address. <laughs> Well, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care of each other. And if you'd like to be on the show or have questions and comments, just drop me an email, paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Paranormal Heart would like to extend a special thank you to PurplePlanet.com for supplying the music for the show. The views and opinions expressed on Paranormal Heart are those of the host and participants. Okay.